Which window? Is okay. Um, hello, everybody. First, I'd like to thank uh, Matteo and Merta for uh, organizing this and for inviting me to add it on to my ICTP visit, um, participating in it. Um, what I'm going to present here can be extended to apply to human being collective agency, but it's a challenging enough problem when you actually are just trying to control collective agents that are automated, that are reinforcement learners or robots or something like that that you yourself have designed. So I'm starting with that. I have control of their minds, and let's see what we can even do with that. This is also what's called distributed control, distributed optimization. It's a huge problem in um, fields from uh, air traffic control to designing clusters of satellites on Mars and things like this. All right. So we're think about um, just optimization, the kind of thing that you might use gradient descent for, simulate annealing, or so on and so forth. We're going to start there. The um, golden rule, so to speak, is, um, is there a pointer here? No, that doesn't work. So you cannot do a laser on it, OK? No lasers. All right. Um, no pointers of any sort. So the, uh, the golden rule um, that I'm going to apply here that actually um, underlies many um, heuristic techniques for optimization that people use is rather than directly try to find the, ver the value of a high dimensional variable x that you would like to optimize, um, uh, you want it, for example, to maximize some function g of x. Instead, search for a distribution q of x that optimizes the expected value of g. The advantage being that you can now actually be doing your search over the space of distributions rather than uh, over the space of the underlying um, variables over what the event space of your sigma algebra. Once you solve for that optimal q of x, eventually it would collapse down to a delta function. But even before you get to that point, what you will have, like in something like simulated annealing, is you'll have a, dis a broader distribution. And to invert at any point in your process to go back from your transformed to the distribution to go back to the original data point, you just sample the distribution. OK? So an example. This is what is done. Nobody formulates it this way. Well, there's a small community that does. In genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms, I've got a current um, uh, distribution, which is basically randomized crossover and mutation. And I'm sampling from that to get a new population. I'm seeing who in that population does best. Based upon that, I'm going to be coming up with yet another implicit distribution. Simulate annealing, this kind of thing is done uh, much more directly. Um, uh, what we want to do in simulate annealing in all these cases is you want to produce a distribution from the data at a particular iteration. This is an iterative procedure. In simulate annealing, what you try to do is you just try to um, find the distribution that will minimize um, the expected value minus um, an entropy term. That is what simulated annealing is basically trying to do. So at any particular stage of simulated annealing, you've got a distribution like this. You sample that Q. You get a bigger data set. You use that to get a refined version of this um, uh, for deep T plus 1. And then you keep repeating. But then you've also got an annealing schedule that temperature T, you notice it's got a time index. It's going down. So this is what is done in simulated. This is what is done in genetic algorithms. This is what is done in general in what's called, um, uh, in some of the some literatures, Monte Carlo optimization. OK? Now, let's look at a special case of interest to this group, and it was also of interest um, to me when I was um, a professor at Stanford, distributed optimization. You've got a set of n agents. These are uh, joint moves, x1 through n. Since they're distributed, they've got a joint probability distribution, which is a product. Notice that's the exact same definition of distributed agents as an iterated um, non-cooperative game theory. This suggests directly modifying that distribution 
which is the distribution of joint moves of the agents in your population, to optimize the expected value of your overall objective function. To connect this up with the uh, game theory literature for people who know the lingo, this is um, actually a, uh, what could be, could be viewed as a variant of exact potential games, sometimes called team games, because... The agents are Yep, yep. They're going to be talking with one another, doing whatever they want, but they actually, when they sample their next move, just like in non-cooperative game theory, you can have an iterated game where I've got information sets and I'm learning things about what Luis did in the previous iterations, but right now, at this moment, I'm just doing, I'm making my joint move by myself, independent of what you're doing. Okay? So, um, let's try to um, combine these things. Um, so we're going to be, we had examples one and two of Monte Carlo um, optimization where GAs and simulated annealing now we're going to be looking at the special case where we've actually got um, a, a distributed a probability distribution. This is um, called, in um, some of the work that I did going back decades, actually, probability collectives. So um, again, just like in simulated annealing, um, we're going to be interested in that particular um, minimization problem. Simulated annealing tries to construct that Q star. That's the optimal one. Instead, since we're in a distributed agents regime, let's try to find the product distribution that actually gets closest to the value of our um, objective function that would be under um, theta star. That would be the optimal one. Well, this is actually, it, um, it turns out, that's the um, relative entropy, that's the KL divergence between um, your product distribution, Q sub theta, and the Boltzmann distribution over G. Q star is actually, um, theta star, Q sub theta star, this is actually the Boltzmann distribution. It's just free energy. And so this difference is actually the KL divergence between Q theta T plus one and uh, the Boltzmann distribution. It's well known what the um, product distribution is that will optimize the KL divergence to any other distribution. It's the product of the marginals. So each agent, each human, each robot, what we want them to do in this distributed version of simulated annealing, if you wish, is they should be trying to um, uh, have their sampling distribution be the marginalization of the Boltzmann down to their own coordinates that they control. And a natural mean field approximation you just bring the expectation value inside. This you can evaluate in a distributed way so everybody can independently run this algorithm. You can use it on your real live robots um, or in the cases that I looked at, everything from drones flying around Stanford's campus to um, uh, flaplets on the rear of a um, aircraft wing. So what you're going to see now these, this is a wind tunnel test. You're going to be looking at a wing from behind. And on the trailing edge of that wing, you're going, there's a total of, I think in this case, it's only four mini flaplets. Flaplets can be up or down. That's it. Binary choice. Binary move space. Okay? The goal, now, this, your, this wing in the wind tunnel, it is um, at the wind speed is up above the um, speed in which it flutters. So you'll see the wing is doing this to start. You do not want to be in an airplane when that is happening. So we but there are four separate flaplets. So the goal is you've got a global accelerometer. That's G. There's no actual underlying modeling of what's going on here. It's not at all like conventional control theory. Our goal is to have those distributed set of four flaplets, in this case, choose whether to be up or down. Dynamically, it's changing in such a way as to get that overall accelerometer value small. You will see that turn on. So let's see. Hopefully, this will work. Yep, that's fine. OK, let me expand it. And there we go. So you'll see my um, 
grad student at the time in the corner. Flutter speed is 15 and a quarter. We're at 15.8. The controller is off. You can see the four trailing edge micro flapless, which can be up or down, and now it's on. I want to be on this airplane. The speed's going to keep going up. This does better than anything um, in what's called, it's called bang-bang control theory to try to deal with these kinds of spaces. This does better than any conventional control theory approach. Eventually, it's going to get up to some ridiculous speed, like 19 meters a second or something like that. And at that point, it'll crap out. And the reason it'll crap out, you can see that the um, flap lifts are dynamically changing. Do I want to be up or down as their data set is changing underneath them? There's no assumptions of stationarity in any of this. They're continually trying to optimize life for themselves. They're being greedy bastards. Uh, you can view this as an economy if you want to view it that way. Um, but eventually, they're not able to go up and down fast enough. That's the hardware. And so the whole thing falls apart. And so here, we're going to have essentially a financial crisis. You can view it that way, um, something like that. So this is 19 meters a second. 15 and a quarter was the onset of flutter. And in just a little bit, there we go, financial crisis. OK. So go to the next slide. There we go. OK. So this is um, uh, up here. I'm just um, reviewing what the underlying algorithm is. But here are some hacks that we had to use in this underlying algorithm. How did we estimate? You, you could always um, you can figure out what the expected value of the entropy is. But how did we um, estimate expected value of g given my own move? We hacked it. We histogrammed. Well, um, damn. Um, because older data points, uh, my data in my, I'm only looking at my own data. And if we go further into the past, the underlying physical system is different. And for that matter, everybody else was using different distributions. So older data is more screwed up. This is a standard problem in all reinforcement learning. Um, how did we deal with that? The same way that, um, uh, the simplest way to deal with it. In standard reinforcement learning, you age. You exponentially age old data um, when you form your histogram to form your um, estimate of what the expected G would be for all the possible moves you might make. Those are hacks. When we get much bigger than just four distributed agents, hacks become a problem. Solution. Um, it turns out, um, and this provides a solution, that Monte Carlo optimization it is formally isometric to machine learning. There is a dictionary you can, I will show you it, you can use to just transfer, translate between the two fields. What that allows us to do is use techniques from machine learning, translate them, and then apply them in the context of Monte Carlo optimization to get a whole bunch more powerful tools. So let's go back down to um, uh, first principles. This is uh, the Monte Carlo optimization problem. You want to optimize the expected value of g, um, where in this case, I'm allowing there to be noise. So uh, p of g given x is not necessarily just a uh, function, a single valued function. It could be a noisy function. We want to find the distribution, q theta, that minimizes that. This is really hard in general. OK, depending on the uh, forms of g. Important sample, though. If we important sample this right there with an important dis sampling distribution h of x, this is now a standard technique. It's not simple sampling. It's what's called important sampling. It's week two rather than week one of your Monte Carlo optimization course. This is approximately equal to that. This is an unbiased estimate, that sum really easy to find the theta that optimizes a sum like that. You can't do it for the integral, but you can do it for the sum. These are empirically generated um, uh, data points down here. So you find the theta that minimizes this, and that's much easier, and you now go to town. So that's one way of viewing the um, logic behind what's called Monte Carlo optimization. That's the same as supervised machine learning. 
supervised machine learning, there's some conditional distribution P of Y given X. You've got a loss function. You want the theta that minimizes this beast. F of theta is your um, fit to the data set, your regression, if you will. And um, this is your loss of that. And here's the actual truth. This looks a little bit different from the integral for MCO, but you can actually just transform things around and it'll fit. So what do we do in supervised learning? Well, you've got a data set there that are samples. And based upon those samples, you actually try to find the um, optimal theta. Here's a dictionary. In Monte Carlo optimization, which is what we're concerned with in problems of collective agency, we've got this joint state space of all of your agents, x. Machine learning, you've got your input space, x. Monte Carlo optimization, there's this um, welfare function, if you like, g, that you want to minimize. Machine learning, it's actually, this should be the typo, that should be a loss function right there. Monte Carlo optimization, you've got a sampling distribution in the important sampling. This, in supervised machine learning, is in active learning, it's under your control. But more generically, if you're just doing supervised machine learning, this is just the distribution over the input values that go into forming your training set. And then the empirical loss functions match up to the um, values uh, that go inside the sum in Monte Carlo optimization. So using that dictionary, you can solve almost every problem that you'd be interested in in distributed optimization by using techniques from machine learning. So for example, how do you shrink the variance? Well, in machine learning, you do it by bagging, regularization, things like this. So in our case, if we use a um, regularizer that is entropy, which makes sense for these distributions, guess what? we get the exact same um, form as we were using for those flaplet experiments, except now there's no problem of data hacks for your data points. You just put in, you know what the distribution was that was used to sample those data points, and you can now put that into your important sampling, no hacks required. In fact, there's no way to even use a hack. This is mathematically exact. It's unbiased. And this solves that problem. But we can do a lot more than just solve that problem of the hack of data aging. How do we do things like um, uh, set a temperature, what's called a hyperparameter in machine learning, cross-validation? So in distributed optimization, Monte Carlo optimization, problems of collective agency, you can take the data that you've already got. There's no, no, you're not generating new data. You divide it into two parts. You train your algorithm on one part and vary the hyperparameter, for example, the temperature in um, simulated annealing, to see what value of that hyperparameter does best on the held out part of your data set. No new data points, and this way, you set mutation rates, you set crossover rates, you can set temperatures, you can set everything in a principled way you're using cross-validation, not generating new samples, which is a hack way of doing it. So, for example, what I'm going to be showing you next, this is, um, we were setting a temperature when we were doing an entropy regularizer, and in this case, our parametric distribution, it wasn't a product distribution. This wasn't a distributed problem. It was just a single Gaussian. In other words, this is automated annealing, simulated annealing where you're using cross-validation to set the temperature. What this allows is for the temperature to change dynamically. So this is inverse temperature. The system was deciding, OK, we can start to anneal. Then it said, whoop, I've annealed too much. I've got to go back and raise my temperature again. And now let me continue. And doing this, you do better than any fixed exponential annealing schedule. This beats the best of the best. Here was our um, uh, performance. 
And uh, here was the best fit exponential annealing schedule. And now I'm going to show another movie. Um, in this case, it's going to be, instead of a single Gaussian, it's going to be a mixture of Gaussians. And what I'm going to be choosing is not a temperature. I'm going to be deciding dynamically the number of mixing components. So for example, translating this into the case of human collective agents, this is the kind of thing like choosing the number of political parties and having that be dynamically changing in such a way as to optimally allow these searching political parties to find the best solution for the problem of how to run your society. Or you can view it as like if you've got a polarized electorate, just how many different um, clusters do we want in this electorate? That'll be varying. This is the optimal way to do that. And so this is going to be another movie. What you're going to be seeing here, it's a mixtures of Gaussians. You're going to see a color map, which is a, a two-dimensional, I think this was a variant of what's called Rosenbrock. Um, a standard um, optimization test suite problem. And you're going to be seeing there's going to be a bunch of ellipses. Those ellipses at any given moment, those are the actual Gaussians in the mixture. You're going to also see some dots. Those are where samples are being drawn. As it goes along, those um, uh, mixing, um, ga uh, those Gaussian ellipses are going to be moving. And you'll see that actually the number of them is going to be changing dynamic. Come on, oops, where'd it go? There we go. Yes, yes, yes. OK, so there's the color map. And blue is good. You can see at this point, there's five components in the mixture, five political parties, if you will. And you can see these um, little x's. Those are the points that have been sampled so far. And there'll be more of these little teeny x's being generated. And there it goes. And so as it's going along, it's moving where the mixtures are, where you're actually doing most of your um, search, where the political parties are. So they've actually now flipped spaces, but now we're down to four political parties. And it'll keep going. And whoop, we're now down to three. Because now everybody's concentrating on just the good region. And um, I forget if that one at the bottom. Yep, we're now down to one. So now everybody is focusing on the best region. Because notice the underlying surface is not dynamically changing. It's fixed. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm throwing a ton in here. This is basically to just stimulate interest more than to convey understanding. <laughs> so it's a mixture model. No, it's changing. And the mixtures has um, a whole bunch of parameters. Number of mixing components. And that's a hyperparameter that is being set by cross-validation. And then there's also the positions of those sure. mixture um, components yeah. and the parameters of the associated Gaussians. So what you're trying to do with this mixture and all the uh, parameters that you're then tuning while you go along is fitting a, a given distribution of Points of samples? No, uh, no, there's an underlying, there's a surface. This is the function g is in blue. Ah, OK, OK. Yeah. That's so you're in, sampling that function, which you're color coding here. It's a distributed and you're optimization. And modeling problem. it with Gaston mixture models? Uh, no, no, no. Um, uh, what we're doing is we're trying to find the maximum. This is an optimization context. That's what collective agent is, is ah. welfare, social welfare. Okay. Thank you for these questions, yeah. So Good. We're no, thank you for clarifying. So we're trying to find what should, where should society be in this two-dimensional space to optimize social welfare. OK, so it's only about the optima that we're looking for here. In this particular case, yeah. Thank you. Exactly so. And we're dynamically changing the distribution of how we're doing the search. Political parties. Or in the context of um, a natural selection, this could be things like the number of species. Um, in the overall population that are reproducing? Is it going to be beneficial, given a limitation on your resources, to reduce the number of species? Things like that. I wouldn't want to push this too far, but you might even think that this might be important when we've got 
problems of biodiversity in, for example, very small reserves, which is a problem to trying to maintain genetic diversity. So uh, do you end up with one political party at the end? Sorry? Do you end up with one political party at the end? Is that what it means? Do I end up with? Is that the, the, the one we made? Oh, they're the best point, yeah. So now we are in a system that has one political party? Yes. Okay. Because, and, because the underlying surface, G, is not changing. Mm -hmm. And then what happens if uh, there is not one optimal solution or that there is a disagreement about what the optimal solution is? There's no, is? Such, what there's no the, room for disagreement. Remember, mm -hmm. this is a team game, as it's called in game theory. So all of the, um, so this is just, you've got one objective function, social mm -hmm. welfare, if you want to call it that. Right, There's but there are different conceptions of social welfare. People will disagree what the optimal will be. So can you introduce that in the model to have oh, different? Oh, um, well, it's actually what's, co um, mm -hmm. what's called in game theory exact potential games allow for some disagreement of that. But um, you can extend this work to model more those kinds of scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but since most this work was actually done in an aero astro department where I was a professor, and we didn't want to have our drones have conflicting purposes um, uh, that would have them flying into one another, things like that. So we didn't pursue that. Um, partly, you could also view this as if the invisible hand works, then even if the, you know under that kind of cartoon, then even if they have conflicting preferences you optimize GDP or something like that. And yes, I fully agree with your shaking of your head. But even in this case, had we had, sorry if I follow up. Uh, Please. Quickly, if had, had we had two Bayesian with the same low value, maybe we uh, would observe maybe two, two Gaussian, even in this, in, in this yep. case, we could have ended up with two things, maybe dynamically changing, which sometimes it becomes one, and then in flickering between oh, the two. Oh, um, uh, very often in that <coughs> case, we'd settle on having just two? Exactly, okay. Um, uh, so if there are two aspects, yeah. And it, but then it'll be. depend, because there's fluctuations, because it's a stochastic process. And so those fluctuations might, at a certain point, make it just go down to one. And then it would probably no go, not go back to two. So that's probably an attractor. It's just uh, to clarify the sort of come a question by Mirta and the shaking head. So in, in and to understand what, what is the analogy with political party. So I think what do I understand correctly that what you are saying is that like political party emerge as uh, alternative local solutions to the same problem, while what Mirta is saying they are alternative solution to conflicting views of what the problem is. Yeah, yeah. This is so an idealized the, yeah. So in this case, there is one global function to optimize that the society want to optimize, and political parties are alternative solution for that. Well, you're saying no, there are alternative problems the, the, that are conflicting. This is, this is political parties among the different um, individuals in a board. This is political parties okay. among the um, robots in a, a von Neumann colony or something like that. One very last thing, and maybe the case that I was talking about is not even that, well, it's the same society has two different problems, and in that case, it could be beneficial to have two political parties in order to maximize these two, in the sense that given that you have two minimum basin for, uh, for the objective function, the best way in which to, optimize, to be optimal in this more complex landscape which does not have only one, mark, one minimum but two is to have two political parties, but it can also be that Different variables have a completely different G, and that it can be any an, another case. And but this is not treated in this. Um, way, so G that is, is shared so between the two variables. So what you're talking about now is actually so this is not quite the same thing as conflicting preferences. It's sort of this is multi what's called multi-objective optimization in um, optimization theory, and so then you start to worry about Pareto frontiers, and this work very naturally extends to Pareto frontiers. That's not quite the same. I mean, sure, yes, sure, there's sure. a Pareto front for a, um, a zero-sum game where we have conflicting preferences. I want you to die. I'm Donald Trump, and I want to kill everybody who doesn't suck my you-know-what. 
And uh, let's say that the people on the other side actually develop a you-know-what and push back. And they might want to, j you know, whatever. Make your silly analogies of choice. Under that kind of a thing, zero sum, the Pareto front, is actually almost degenerate. And that's the extreme version of conflicts, which is where you would want mechanism design. What mechanism design is really all about, and that is arguably the proper way to actually design incentives for externalities to actually make for what are called efficient outcomes in economics, Pareto efficient. That would mean that you're adding terms to the preference functions, the utilities of each of the individual agents so that they behave like a team game. And so that's the simplest way to actually translate this into something that's got to do with political system, with how we run our human society as opposed to running a robot society. And mechanism design, that works pretty well. Um, things like Vickery's auctions and things like this within certain domains of applicability, that does work. And that completely addresses actually Murta's concern. Um, but that's an extra part that I'm not showing here. OK? All right. Let's move on. OK, future work. What I just showed you was mixture models, Gaussians. Mixture models are not a product distribution. Well, so the obvious thing, what has not been done yet, this is future work, is to combine that machine learning augmented Monte Carlo optimization, which I was showing in those last set of movies, with the distributed optimization context, so we have a product distribution, and then try to optimize situations in this case. So a um, subtlety is that this requires for the agents to be able to evaluate that. That means that everybody must broadcast their sampling distribution to the others after they've used it. So it doesn't have to be done fast, but just at the end of the day, for me to actually form my important sampling um, estimate correctly, I need to know what society's distribution was for society's joint move last month. So that kind of information, if you think about it, that is what a lot of the reporting done by federal regulators is all about. This is what the unemployment numbers were for last week, for last month. This is what the inflation rate was, and so on. This is taking, at a high level, information from everybody, broadcasting it to everybody, view a centralized repository, to help those individuals optimize their own decision problems. So it's already being done. OK. And uh, that's um, pretty much it, exactly on time. What do you know? Any more questions? about the spiral in your introductory slide? The you had, it was like a spiral in the desert. Your web page. My web page, you mean. Oh, is that what it is? I don't know. Yeah, that was actually um, a pattern of somebody who had filled in cracks in a road It was made with by tar. people. Made by people. That okay. was made by, well, like spiral jetty, sort of, I suppose. Some sort of collective, you know, distributed. Emergent well, something. Well, it could be. Could be. Yeah. There's a lot of. If you want some strange stuff, go to my what I call self indulgences on my website. If you want some strange stuff. So, so this last part, I want to ask a question about that. And since this is future work, you may not know the answer. Um, so a lot of times in game theory, when you this, this this last bit is a problem, and this is like what mechanism design does, right? Like if you have a private information you may not reveal it. You may want, not want to reveal it, right? So. And, and so to a degree, what one would have to do, again, in the case of humans, I like robots. This is a difficult thing to do even yeah. for robots, I should emphasize. This is not a trivial problem. Um, but uh, in practice, for something like that, what you'd have to do is some kind of a partial hack. So some things you'd have to be doing, um, estimations and some data aging and things like that. Whatever you can know, you would use. So it wouldn't be 100% principled, but better than um, what we have been doing before. Thanks, this is really cool. 
Um, you keep making this distinction between robots and people, and I wonder, just Maybe just to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, it's it's fine. But I wonder if what if we imagine that people are just sort of like really stochastic robots, right? They're just really noisy robots. Yeah, yeah. The, when I'm actually saying robots, what that's actually um, a code for is that I get to design their heads. Right, right. I get it. No, but, but what I'm what I'm asking is, if people were just really stochastic, right? Would all the same things still be true, or would there be any additional things you might want to add? Suppose you just add noise to each of your agents, right? Oh, these um, are already noisy. They're sampling random sampling distributions. Right, right. But so, is there? Can you add more noise to them? Um, well, the system will be designed. The system's the cross, designing how much noise to add, right? The cross validation yeah, yeah, yeah. is designed. But what if that? people just have more noise? So, in other words, if people are not optimal, I don't think that they are. Um, right. So they're, they're just noisier. Does any, we do might have be to noisier, do, or do, have to we, do well, anything? We might, might not be noisy enough. Um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you could do actually an interesting um, psychological experiment. Put people into a situation where we can know what the optimal noise would be and see if people anneal like this in mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. What kind of group structures of, because humans have lots of biases, quote unquote biases, quirks and um, uh, idiosyncrasies. And they may or may not actually have, uh, each of them individually, the appropriate level of noise when they're engaged in a group task. Interesting experiment. Right. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Another way to view all this is um, there's an age-old phrase, which is kind of vacuous and annoying as hell, called exploration versus exploitation. This formalizes it and derives it. It's not just some, oh, I kind of noticed that sometimes I want to exploit, sometimes I want to explore, and do do No, uh, this is math. Yes. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. So no, I was thinking about your last comment uh, that um, uh, I mean, this information need to be broadcasted to all uh, um, agents. Mm -hmm. and, um, but then uh, uh, it's not just the information about the last point. I mean, uh, what are you meaning? I mean, because I say uh, agents need to know the distribution, right? Uh, you, because and they and have you, to no. estimate uh, the so, you can, on a so you can think point, of it as right? an iterative non-cooperative so, game. Um, that is you can un think of it as an iterative non-cooperative game where I, maybe with some delay, doesn't have to be right away, I'm telling the other people in the game with me, by the way, this is what my mixing dis my mixture distribution was, um, uh, say, five rounds ago, and this is the move that I made five rounds ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, but, yeah, I mean, it was just a comment that, Say beliefs are playing an important role. So the fact that beliefs on probability distribution. So um, oh, uh, if in fact that gets back to the earlier question. If in fact not it is not the case that distributions are broadcast, then beliefs or <coughs> statistical estimates of distributions would be playing a role. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're correct. Yeah. And also, I was wondering uh, uh, whether this type of problem, uh, can they be solved uh, with mass, uh, message passing algorithm or things like this? Uh, um, I view message passing, interesting, so you're talking about the broadcast part of the problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about joint. belief propagation, uh, cavity yeah, 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 yeah. methods, uh, these kind yeah, of yeah, things. But, but, uh, so you're thinking like of using message passing as a way for everybody to get the information about what the distribution was. Yep, that, under the normal caveats that you have a tree-like structure and things like that, um, would be an efficient way to get that information so that everybody can calculate their marginals, which is all that they need to do. Yeah. Good idea. So, um, uh, uh, does this approach require us to specify what we want to optimize beforehand? Right? Or, in the case of the accelerometer, 
just what physical thing out there is it that I want to get into the desired range? Because there's no model of that physical plant. Okay, so there's something, there's some variable, there's some uh, variable that I want to be in a particular range, and uh, that's okay. So that that is another class of things that I. Want. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, uh, in social problems, very often we don't know, we can't formulate the objective, you know, uh, in, sure. in, in in these terms, right? I mean, I, sure. I want so to I don't improve disagree. the quality of uh, democracy in my country, but, you know, I. Um, I don't have an objective function or something that I want in a particular range, then what do I do? In that particular case, I would say then vote against the BJP. Um, but in any case, um, but, uh, but that's true of uh, all of, this is welfare economics, uh, macroeconomics. This is what um, the, centr the um, uh, European Central Bank does. This is what the Fed does. This is macroeconomics. So yeah, you're assuming that there is a welfare function. I don't. I would much prefer it that interesting, deep movies appear in the next couple of months that I might be able to stream. Nobody's going to formalize that, and that would be an inappropriate way um, uh, feature to go into measuring the, um, defining the function G for whatever society it is that I happen to inhabit. Maybe we get the inspiration from Carolina data set <clears throat> for those Sorry. objective function, uh, I don't know. Uh, you, yeah. Sorry, what was the question? What? From uh, Karolina's talk on uh, how to quantify democracy. Maybe we can take inspiration from there. Too. Yep, yep, yep. Once we've got something that's formalized like that, yep, bingo. So um, you made the analogy that you could also think of the ellipses as um, species. Um, Very loose. Enough. Sure, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask an annoying what if question. Um, could you generalize this then to allow for scenarios in which you have predators and prey, i.e., in which the species' welfare depends on their ability to decrease the welfare of the other species and so on? Well, that's getting to a Murch's concern. So, a first approximation. My response would be thinking like a game theoretician, which I once upon a time was, um, uh, mechanism design. So I'll be modifying. It's, it's a real um, externality, so to speak, for you to eat me. Me sure. And so we would try to um, take care of that by, I don't know, taxing you if you eat somebody else. Um, but that's glib. Um, What's the optimization problem? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if I want to design a ecosystem to be stable, if I want to maintain it to maintain high biodiversity, and I have some control levers, that's not the individual species, but there might This only actually, it maps well onto things like genetic algorithms, but genetic algorithms are a cartoon of real natural selection. Real natural selection is not teleological. If we were to hypothesize that it is, that some appropriate measure of complexity is going up over biological time frames, that say the percentage of free energy flux from the sun that's exploited to make ATP is going up over time, over hundreds of millions of years or something. Treat that as a goal, you know, almost like a Gaia hypothesis kind of a way, that might provide some insights. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just brainstorming oh, here. That's, I love that answer. So. Yeah. OK. Um, I think we. Can thank again David Letts. Okay. And all the speakers.